welcome to the show. This is Sound Out. With me today is uh, an incredible musician with a truly fascinating story. A uh, friend of mine, I'm excited to welcome to the show, Kim Byer. How you doing today? Pretty good. How are you, Justin? I'm good. I'm good. Um, we've been trying to nail this down for a while, so I'm excited to, to finally have a chance to, to talk to you about um, just like so many of the truly fascinating, crazy things that you have had going on in your life. And it's just, I mean, yeah. talk about an interesting story. Um, and we've got a lot of that we want to get into, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, you're a musician based in Columbus, Ohio, uh, doing some really cool um, music and just combining a lot of different genres. Uh, I guess let's just start like, you're talking about how you kind of got your start in, in the world of music. Sure. Um, I've always been kind of a music nerd, like, um, grew up, like, watching musicals and dad playing all kinds of stuff. We had this big uh, VW bus for a long time that had an 8-track in it, and dad would, like, we would go to the thrift store and find 8-tracks and put them there because we couldn't, like, buy them in a normal store. <laughs> um, so just, like, a house full of music, and I don't know, um, I just... I was singing from a young age, and it was just always something kind of magical for me, and never, never got old, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that's a good thing that it hasn't got old, because it's, it's, it seems like it's a <laughs> yeah. big part of your life today. 40 years in, that's, that's pretty good, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, yeah. who, who were some of your, uh, you know, I guess growing up, teenage years, whatever, like, who were some of the yeah. musicians or the... Um, the bands that you were into. Speaking of eight tracks, the the Carpenters, like I listened, we wore that one out. So like, I think they helped me develop an ear for melodies. Um, and like when I got older, I I was just so into like anything that had really intricate arrangements, like Rufus Wainwright, Amy Mann, John Bryan, um, Tim Apple, which is funny to people because I don't sound like that at all. No, <laughs> I just really appreciate the thought that goes into like all the layers in a song and um like i love songs where you have to turn it up really loud to hear everything you know or like so, you have the headphones on right you can hear yeah, you know, left don't right speaker don't do that yeah. yeah you know obviously i'm sure you have your own wording for it but like when i hear your music i think it's like dance pop was rock and fusion like all this kind of cool stuff going on and it's you talk about your earliest exposure to music and, and the, the bands and the artists that really kind of uh, influenced you it is it is quite a departure but you've kind of shaped your yeah. own way over the years i guess right and i guess i mean in general like pop if it's got a if it's got a good hook if it's got something that's in there that's going to stand my head for a few days i mean that's kind of pop music in general right like i've always <clears throat> i've always like listened to top 40 radio a little bit but like in secret <laughs> like all my friends are like cool with other cool bands and stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I like that too. And then I'll go home and listen to it a little bit. And I'm like, but what's, uh, what's this week just listen to? Just listen, you know? <laughs> well, who, who are some of the, the artists today that, that you do like, you know, across the genres? What's that? Today? Yeah. Um, today. Today, what I listen to is more like the stuff that I put out. Um, I love, uh, K Slay, like I'm on a huge K Slay kick right now. She's she's, um, she's, she's great. Out new album on Friday. I've been wearing it out. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> who else is into the rotation? Paris. I like Paris a lot. Um, Paris, like with the A, is turned upside down like a V. Yeah. So, that that nobody knows how to pronounce quite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Noah Gunderson, I and he's more acoustic. Um, it's strange. I'll like I'll go back and forth. Like either I want my music like super loud and intense and in your face, or like I want it very quiet and calm and stripped down and like just say the thing that matters. You know, um, I guess it just depends on my mood. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think I think you and and K Slay on a bill together would be like perfect. That would be I can I can. Say that. What's that? <laughs> Yeah, I said, say you you agree. <laughs> I mean, I, talk about dreams coming true. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say between you and I, or some of the people that we know, somebody's got to have a contact with with her. You know what I mean? I hope. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big I'm a big fan as well. I, I, I've 
I've never had the pleasure of, uh, of seeing Tay Flight perform live. Um, and it's kind of on my short list of people that, uh, like I haven't seen that I, that I've got to. So yeah, just you can come to Columbus, you can play a show with her or maybe do a tour, you know, and then I've got my in. Yeah. If I make it happen, I, ex- I expect like to be on the guest list is all I'm saying. You're front row. You're in Christina. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, okay, we're talking about like your your music and the things that you've got going on today, and the, and then uh, you know your band, the Live Wires, right? So, how did uh, uh, I, th- I think whenever like I was probably first familiar with your stuff, you guys were just kind of kind of forming and kind of figuring that out a little bit. Um, but so, how did that come together though, where you kind of transition from you performing and doing your thing to getting this this kind of I don't know. I mean, you guys are like you guys are like a rocking band, uh, and it's um, I think super fun to see, uh, you know, that performance. Like, it, it even even if it's acoustic or whatever. But anyway, I digress. How did how did you guys um, uh, get together? Yeah, um, Johnny, my drummer. He's one of my longtime friends. Um, probably one of yeah. He's definitely one of the first people I met when I moved to Columbus like 13 years ago. And um, our uh, guitarist, Kyle, um, he is one of Johnny's longest friends. Um, So they go back to like their college days. And I honestly didn't think that I'd continue with music. I wasn't trying to get into this as a career. I wanted to make like a a passion project a couple years ago, just about a a pop album about grief because I've I've seen a lot of grief. Um, And Johnny kind of helped me get that off the ground, but um, I really just thought I'd put it out and never perform any of the songs live, and people were like, that's ridiculous, of course you will, I'm like, eh, but then, you know, requests started coming, I'm like, okay, maybe it would be fun to do once or twice, but I had no idea how, because I'd never done, like, pop music before, um, I've always, when I've performed, I've been, like, the girl with the guitar, you know, sitting on a stool in a coffee shop, doing singer-songwriter type stuff, so, like, I just, I had no idea how to do that kind of upbeat um, dance pop style of music live in a way that's not karaoke, you know? I wanted right. there to be real instruments, and I'm not opposed to backing tracks, but, like, let's make it a little more interesting than this, you know? And Johnny was like, I got you. Um, he actually, he, I was doing a music video for one of my songs, and I asked Johnny and Kyle to come be the backing band in the music video, just like my fake band in the music video. And <laughs> we had the best time filming that. And they were like, this is going to be a thing, Kim. Like, we just need to be your real band, not just your fake one in videos. Because <laughs> we know how to do the music. So I was like, don't, you don't need to convince me. So, um, yeah, we started putting a set together. And Kyle's a genius. He's like, he functions as a music director for us. Um, so he... I don't know, he, he like speaks another language that Johnny and I don't know, but we're like, yes, Kyle, (laughs) (laughs) a wise one, (laughs) whatever he says, like, that's what we need to do. And it's going to work out. We both know. (laughs) So we come in with like this whole big spaceship and, um, I don't know, but I'm so grateful for the two of them. Like they're both so, uh, energetic on stage and just like love the music and they're dear friends, and I think that comes across when we perform. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I think we've been able to put together a really good show for people. And um, we recently started writing together and recording together as well. Up until this year, it had just been um, me recording songs and then them learning the songs I had recorded. So it's it's really become a collaborative thing, and I wouldn't want it any other way. They're, they're fantastic. Yeah, they, I mean, they're like uh, sweetheart fellows, like super, super yes. like yes. good dudes. And, I, you know, I don't know them well, but I really enjoy like just being around them the, the times that I have. So, uh, really, and super talented yeah. as well. Um, yeah. But you brought up something interesting that I'd like to kind of touch on a little bit. How, how has that uh, transition been for you kind of going from writing and uh, creating the music having them come in and just learn it versus the collaborative effort. What's that transition been like? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of collaborating. Like I, I don't have like 
do the syndrome or whatever, like I know this much and I do my best with it, but I've always done well with, I, I just try to work with people who come from a different place, who know more than I do. That's the best way to learn um, and the best way to have fun too. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, uh, my producer actually, he suggested that I start bringing them in on things because he could just see how we, how we mesh. And uh, so they, uh, they were up for it. They were really excited and like, it was different and really nice to not have to do everything. Yeah. And like, that it still turned out awesome. <laughs> like, um, I was the dorky kid in high school who like, I hated group assignments because um, like, I would, I would want to do everything myself so that we would get a good grade. Like, I was just a snob of a guy. And you would have been like, my ideal partner. <laughs> You just do it. We'll get a good grade. I'll come in. I'll help present. Boom. We're done. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I've learned to get over that over the years. It's not a great way to go through life. No. Only trying to depend on yourself. Um, you'll hit a ceiling real fast. And like, it can be hard though, right? Yeah. Like to, I mean, to, to be able to, not that because you had to uh, do it, mm -hmm. but you just felt comfortable in your space doing things by yourself. You know, it's sometimes it's, it's hard to open yourself up yeah. and, you know, collaboration is a beautiful thing and absolutely I love it. But at first it can be a little scary, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think um, the three of us, like, we're such good friends and had shared so much life together at that point that, like, we're really comfortable just being dumb around each other and making dumb suggestions and like nothing's off the table, you know, and those are the kind of people you want to work with um, where you're not afraid to bring whatever ideas you have. Cause yeah. even if they're stupid, there might be something in there that somebody else hears and they can, you know, it can take us down a path that we weren't thinking about before. Um, 100%. But it, it, it was great. Yeah. No, I'm saying it, it just to be able to, to be able to throw out something that maybe deemed dumb and you know maybe a little good good nature you know busting of the chops but nothing you know no judgment right like that's to be able to open up and be vulnerable like that i think is, is so crucial to the creative uh process of that not to be like scoffing like, oh that's stupid get out of here because then you're not going to do it again life's too short for that stuff man yeah. people got to get over that those attitudes and like <clears throat> yeah I think too, as an artist, you can't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> like the things that I recorded, you know, 20 years ago, and I was like so serious about them. And you listen to me now and you're like, girl, <laughs> you know? and you, just what time you figure out, like, you're not that awesome. You're fine. You're fine. Like, just don't take yourself so seriously. Just hold your art out with open hands and let people play in it and we'll make something better together. You know, that's kind of my philosophy. A hundred percent. I, I recently, so I, I used to play, you know, a lot more often than I do now. And I used to write a lot of music and stuff. And I, and I, and I thought it was something pretty, pretty special back in the day. And uh, I was recently going through my closet and organizing some stuff. And I found one of my old notepads of all my songs. And okay. let's just say, I won't be sharing that with anybody anytime. I'm just like, Oh dude. Oh, and it's like shit that I thought was like profound at the time. And I'm like, I was an idiot. Oh, I've been there, man. I've been there. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's funny, though. A little bit of – so, you know, that's why I, I – you know, I think some of these uh, musicians oh, – I, I heard uh, we were talking a little bit about music before you, you, uh, we start recording, and I was listening to an interview the other day with, uh, like, Bo Burnham. You know him, the comedian that like, plays piano and all that? And he was just talking about his kind of rise to stardom, you know, through vines and the internet age and all that. And he's like, the, I never really did comedy clubs. He says, the first song I ever wrote, I put on YouTube, and it's out there forever. And that's so many people's first introduction to me. And I was like 16. You know what I mean? So he's a little, he was just talking about how he was a little almost embarrassed by that. Um, so if he's embarrassed by the stuff he did when he was 16, you can imagine how somebody like myself who doesn't have the talent that Bo has would be feeling about the stuff that... <laughs> that to be the first thing that's out there right that people see and when you're such a young age it's an interesting dynamic yeah. i think yeah 
It's one of the reasons I want to keep going. <laughs> get the get the new stuff up to the top of the search engine. Look, we're growing. We're growing. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, and it's 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 interesting because I, I mean, I know you, you know, and and I'm very familiar with all of your stuff. But I always just do a, a little Google search to see if there's anything and I'm missing or whatever. And it's just like you're not sharing your name with anybody else. Type in your name to Google, and it's you. It's like all your stuff. And that's kind of cool. Only for other reasons, though. Well, yeah, that's that's a nice that's an interesting segue. Not only for other reasons. But one of those reasons is an interesting segue into the, the something else that, like, I feel that we have to talk about. And I know you've talked about it a lot, uh, and you're very open about it. But, you know, I would love to kind of get some of this conversation on record with my show just about the um, the backstory of uh, you and your husband, what, what happened to him, what you guys have went through. And, um, you know, when I talk about an interesting story. I'm, I'm talking about your musical, uh, you know, uh, upbringing and, and all of that, but also this is a part of that. So, um, you know, where, where do we even start with this? I'll take it away. Well, I guess the passion project I mentioned was like, I recorded that shortly after COVID. Um, <clears throat> uh, so my husband, uh, ex-husband, it would be about eight years ago, now a little over eight years ago, he had a um, brain aneurysm, just kind of out of nowhere, um, that uh, just, man, really impacted him um, physically, emotionally, mentally, in all the ways. <laughs> and our whole family, um, the kids were real little. Our youngest was only four months old. And um, so, like, we'd been together for 10 years at that point. And it was just like being all of us thrown into this completely other life all of a sudden. Um, <clears throat> and uh, gosh, he wasn't expected to survive, um, but he did. And um, we spent years um, just trying to work him back to like a state of independence. Um, and I was functioning as his primary caregiver. Uh, so he went from being like, a vegetable to um, being able to walk and talk again. Um, I, I'm, I was able in the end to like leave, you know, leave town for trips for like a week at a time to go record or whatever. And he, he used to be able to stay here at the house and make himself meals. I mean, he really has come a long way since the founding. Um, <clears throat> but like when COVID hit, that was the first time really that I was able to realize like, wow, this really took a toll on all of us. And I am grieving hard for, like, the life I used to have. Um, and maybe bad things happen to other people, too, and they they need songs about the grief. And I just, like, was writing all these songs at night on my piano, and um, Johnny heard them, and he was like, you have to record these. So uh, initially, that's all it was. Like, I put out this album in 2021 um, called Stages, for Stages of Grief, um, just kind of documenting like all the strange feelings and situations that you go through when you're losing the love of your life, basically, as you knew him. Um, <clears throat> and it's a very strange kind of grief because uh, you're saying goodbye to, you know, um, the person that you've done life with for 10 years, uh, as you knew him, you know, um, and he's never coming back, but physically he's still right there uh, so it's, it's a very strange uh, place to be in, um, and I'm glad that I was able to <clears throat> work through some of that through music. It was really um, meaningful for me, and I'm glad that it's been meaningful for others, the project. Uh, and then, you know, as we just um, continued after that, uh, we noticed, uh, we, when I say we, I'm talking about, like, his family um, members, like his mom and his sisters and my parents who um, help us, were helping us out a lot, we had started to notice um, he needed more. Like, I'd kind of gotten him as far as I could, you know? Um, and he needed, like, a level of therapy that we couldn't afford. Um, <clears throat> he needed people who weren't also trying to raise two children <laughs> at the same time. Um, 
And so, like, our big, you know, extended family, we had a, a powwow and decided to um, move him to Germany to live with his, his side of the family um, because Germany's wonderful <laughs> for that kind of thing. Like, they really take care of people who've been through the unimaginable. And, like, um, we ended up getting divorced, and, like, it's very amicable. Um, he, we just had both changed so much and felt like friends more than spouses. And uh, I knew that that's what he would have wanted for me. And um, so one day <laughs> I got on TikTok, <laughs> uh, the day that I got divorced, and I was just like, I got divorced today from a really amazing person. And, you know, kind of told my story and woke up the next morning to millions of viewers. So that, that's, uh, that, that was crazy. Do you have any idea how that happened? How did it catch on like that, just overnight? Um, yeah, it just went viral. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the my opening line just happened to be something that really grabbed people's attention because they're like, "You got divorced from someone amazing? Why would you do that?" Yeah. And our story is so dramatic that, like, as I was telling it, I had people commenting like, "This isn't real. This didn't really happen." having an aneurysm, going from a vegetable to, like, being, they're like, no way. I'm like, I promise this is my real life. And, like, had to show pictures and bring him on TikTok and stuff. Um, but, like, that's been a real turning point for us um, because I retained a lot of those viewers, um, and they just asked a million questions. And so we're, like, telling our family's story on TikTok in these little bite-sized videos. Um, and... Uh, a lot of my music comes from that place, not TikTok, but from our, our family's story. Um, yeah, so it's all kind of, um, uh, it's all kind of intertwined, like, you know, connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, um, so, you know, you're, you're um, taking care of your husband, you know, uh, through his recovery as much as you could you're raising your kids uh essentially you know doing all of that by yourself and and that's whenever stages sort of came out of that um mm -hmm. you know you mentioned that was helpful to other people you know obviously you did it as a form of of almost therapy but with a little bit of time between you know then and now looking back mm -hmm. How much did creating that album ultimately help you, do you think? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I think it helped me, like, actually look at why I make music and why it matters at all. And um, <clears throat> is this a worthy endeavor? Like, it's always been the thing that I really wanted to do because it touches people. Like, it's a connector. Um, it's therapeutic. It's it, since like the beginning of time, you know, it's not going anywhere. And I just, I just think it's kind of magical. And uh, <clears throat> I think that I'm a very busy person. I make myself busy. I was very busy. I was very in church back then. And so like just always running around, always a million things to do. And I think that was the first time that I like made myself sit down and actually look at my life and what was happening and, you know, especially like right after COVID um, and things opening back up, like, I feel like a lot of people were in that place, a lot of creatives, like, whoa, what just happened? And I'm home all the time, so let's just take a minute to like really sift through our lives and what, what, what matters here? What are we doing right. here? I mean, without everything that you had going on, it affected everybody else. You know what I mean? And, and you know, other people had other things that they were dealing with. Sure. Uh, not to diminish any of that whatsoever, but just, you know, you kind of hit something right on there, like nail on the head. COVID in and of itself already kind of affected everybody and, and had a unique kind of effect on creatives. And a lot of those creatives were not also, you know, carrying – or their partner who had went through such a, you know, crazy situation, raising two kids. So, I mean, that, that's the song is all, it's amazing stuff. Uh, you know, really 
um, since I had, you know, known a little bit about the backstory behind them, it really takes on a whole new kind of uh, feeling for me. And I think it's something that, you know, uh, I've been through my shit, you know, everybody's been through something, right? And just to be able to kind of, it's important, you know, I think it helps you, it helps other people. And that's the, that's the power of music, right? Yeah. Yeah, it truly is. Um, you, know, you talked about how involved you were in the church. I think that's also a fascinating story. I'd like to touch on that a little bit. Um, uh, you know, you were very, very involved in the church. You are not now. Um, how did we get here from where you were? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I think that when you've been through like a family crisis like us, it definitely makes you take a harder, you know, closer look at your beliefs. Um, and I feel like I just had kind of gone along with everything that was handed down to me faith wise. Were you, ra were you raised that way? It was just um, all you kind of ever knew? Yes. Yeah. 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 I've never, I've never not been a Christian. Right. <laughs> and, uh, so definitely you start asking questions like why, why is this happening to us? Why does this happen to other people too? Like where, I don't know. You just, uh, theodicy is what it's called. The question of like, why do bad things happen? I was just always on my brain. Um, was doing a lot of reading and stuff about it. And at the same time that I was starting to see like cracks in my beliefs, um, I also was seeing cracks in like just the, the system of church too. I was pretty involved in church leadership. Um, I was a worship leader for a very long time. Uh, <clears throat> the last place I was at um, was a mega church. So that was like a whole other, <clears throat> um, I have a lot to learn <laughs> just being thrown into that. Like um, church as a more corporate thing is very different, but um, I just, I feel like I saw a lot of things go on behind the scenes that really disappointed me. Like, this isn't what we're supposed to be doing, guys. Really, this is what we're hung up on? And, um, kind of the, the, the thing that brought it all, you know, crumbling down for me was, um, uh, one of my pastors, um, one night he was drunk and he came on to me and, uh, you know, I, like, I was able to get out of the situation, but I didn't say anything about it for a long time. He was a powerful person, and, like, all the things that I've since learned <clears throat> that victims say, it was really reassuring to, like, hear other people's stories and be like, oh, okay, so I'm not just weird. Like, this is common that you feel scared, that you don't want to come forward, that <clears throat> you don't want to expose someone, that you're like, well, but not everything he's done is bad. <laughs> And this you was know, somebody that he was. It's not my life. Right. This was your pa the pastor, and yeah. I'm, I'm assuming somebody that you had trust in, right? That you knew oh, that yeah. you, you knew him yeah. well, and then, I mean, so it was a quite a betrayal of that trust, I would imagine. Absolutely, and we were both married at the time, and like, um, I, you know, I'm not like an angry person. I, I really think that I could have, it would have taken a lot, but I think that I could have worked through that and been okay. But like when I did finally come forward, um, he said that I made a mistake, uh, like that it wasn't, it wasn't real. And I was like, <laughs> that, <clears throat> I just feel like everything broke that day is how I could ex explain it. And I've never been able to go back. And it's not, a lot of people assume that, um, I think Christians, a lot of Christians assume that when people leave the church and stay away from church, that it's because of church hurt and anger. Um, and sometimes it is, but uh, I'm a big fan of therapy. I've done lots of therapy for that whole thing and worked through it and, you know, forgiveness and all that. Um, and like, I really think that it runs deeper than that incident this point like just more fundamental questions that I have about God and his nature and you know people who who aren't in church they can be very like thoughtful smart people <laughs> believe it or not Christian. Right. <laughs> and I, I can't say that I'll never go back 
like I feel like I'm very much in the middle of a crisis of faith, which I've also tried to document it um, for my book too. Or um, I just want people to know that like it's okay to not know exactly what you believe. I feel like we're always well, there are atheists and there are Christians. Like you do believe or you don't believe. I think that I don't know is a really normal place to be, and I want to kind of create a safe space for people to have conversations about that and work it out and where people aren't just mad and like emotionally invested when you choose the thing they wouldn't have chosen for themselves, you know? It's a fascinating thing. I had um, uh, incredibly interesting uh, gentleman uh, on um, uh, an earlier episode of the show, Father Max- Maximus McIntyre, and I had my questions as well. You know, and, and, and something I always kind of wondered and I, and I asked him uh, about is one of these things. Right. So, you know, God is loving. God is nurturing. He's forgiving all of these things. Right. OK. So why is it that you hear in so many churches that if you don't believe like Christian churches, if you don't believe this, then you're going to hell. So I, I asked him, you know, well, what do you say to a child who was born into a different religion? on the other side of the world that doesn't even know about this. They're condemned to hell because they don't follow this guideline that, you know, Christians deem is the only way. Because you hear people say, well, they should find Christ. They should find Christ. And that's absurd. They, like how, how, you know? So, I mean, and, and he, you know, he, he just basically said that he doesn't feel that way that, you know, he, that's ridiculous to think that a child would, you know what I mean? When I, and like, finally, that's somebody that gave an actual answer to the question. You know, like, of course, a child would not go to hell because they were born, you know, into Islam or whatever it may be. You know what I mean? But you hear people at these churches that would say such a thing. You know, it's it's hellfire and brimstone. If you don't believe, if you're if you're different than us in any way, shame on you. You know, and that's something that I've always struggled with. It's difficult. Yeah, that's What's that? <laughs> that's a tough It one. is. It is. I have I mean I have a lot of questions like that, you know, and uh you know, and I, I have my relationship with 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 God and it's a personal one, but I've always struggled to find a church that I felt that was accepting. Cuz I'm I, I'll be damned if I'm going to go to a church that you know, says you know, homosexuality is a sin or if you're a different religion you're not welcome here and a lot of them might not come right out and say that but there's that that vibe that feeling you know and um it's difficult to find a church and to find a space where it's like you you want to celebrate god and thank him and all are truly welcome because we all are truly the same regardless of sexual orientation and what your actual faith is and all of these things. It's just, it's unbelievably frustrating. Uh, some of, some of the most judgmental people that I have ever encountered in my life claim to be Christians. I can only imagine what you have went through, um, you know, after coming forward against the minister. Yeah, it's um, it's been hard. There's, they, I, I feel like the church handled it pretty responsibly, um, and immediately like hired a third party to come in and investigate, and they're very thorough and <clears throat> um, wrote a whole report. But the the company isn't great, I guess. And like, gosh, it's September, so it's been over a year that I've been participating in this investigation and it's still not over. And at this point, I'm just like, I don't care. (laughs) I got to move on with my life. Like it is very hard leaving just a church, I think, um, let alone the church. uh, Because when you're an invested member of a congregation, like those are your friends, those are your people. Like you're just kind of without community. if you're that invested and then you leave um i try to encourage people to like do other things too (laughs) like if if you want to be in church that's great but do other stuff too have other friends know people who have other points of view like i 
because I feel like it's too risky to make that everything. I yeah, I mean, know. it's important to have that. Like, you can't have all the eggs in one basket, so to speak, right? Like, the diversity amongst friends and different people and different backgrounds, I think, yeah. is important uh, for so many reasons. Um, so you said this happened, the investigation's been about a year. Uh, how long ago, roughly, did the did the incident take place? Was it shortly before that, or was it a while before you be before you came forward? Um, it's been almost two years yeah. ago now. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, I think maybe like six to nine months. It, it took me, and I didn't even actually come forward. Like I was venting to someone, and it just slipped out, and then they reported it, and I was like, "Yep, that's that's real. That happened." Then you know called into HR and had to report. Um, so <clears throat> it was kind of decided for me, but in the end, I'm glad because, um, I don't know, I just think truth wins. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of, of honesty and just, like, dealing with it. <laughs> Let I, I just read this book of, um, by a guy named Sam Harris. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. Uh, he wrote this book called Lying about even like the little white lies that we tell each other to make each other feel better. Like, just don't, just, just be honest. And like, we'll, we're grownups. We can deal with stuff. <laughs> we'll figure it out. I don't know. So you kind of, you kind of touched on this a little bit. You kind of, you may have already answered it, but um, I'm going to ask you anyway, just kind of yeah. point blank. If somebody's going through a similar situation with, um, mm-hmm questioning uh, you know, the church, questioning uh, their faith. Uh, and again, you kind of touched on it, but like what specific advice would you give to somebody that was in a similar situation? What would you tell them? Yeah. I would tell them to separate belief in uh, the church from belief in God. They're two separate things. Um, Cause That's good. The church is supposed to be a representation of God, but they fuck it up all the yeah. time. So, like, if you're hurt by the church, it doesn't necessarily mean it came from God. So just, I think it's healthy to separate them and work through the two separate issues. That's great. Um, that's, that's, that's and, so good. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and take your time. Like, there's so much pressure um, from all sides to, like, know what you believe and have an answer. And people are very uncomfortable when somebody says, I don't know. And they're totally fine saying that. <laughs> um, I... I just think that's a really honest and normal place to be is in the I don't know. Um, Don't let people pressure you to make decisions before you're ready. Um, Take your time with it. Like, and if you feel comfortable asking God your questions, ask him your questions. Like, look at David. Like, nothing's off limits. Um, and, And find people and books um, who have different perspectives. Like like me, I grew up hearing one thing my entire life, and I just was really curious, like, why do other people leave church? Why isn't that rewarded church? What are, what are what other reasons do people have for leaving church and staying out or for leaving and coming back? Like, um, that's been really helpful for me to have a variety of sources. Yeah, that's great advice. Um it's, it's comforting for me to hear what you said right out of the gate, you know what I mean? Because that's the, kind of my issue as well, like I was saying, you know, God and the church are not necessarily the same thing, you know? Uh, so, yeah, thanks for sharing that for sure. That's, that was um, insightful. It's profound, honestly. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is, it is the tough thing. It's, it's something that's interesting to me. And I, I, you know, I just, I, you know, I have friends that all different, you know, types of faith or lack thereof, you know, and it's, and we all have civil conversations and respect each other. And, and I think there is kind of, you know, uh, importance to that respect and being able to talk to people, not judgmental and not, I know better than you, or I'm part of the secret club. And you better be there too. You know what I mean? It just makes folks shut down. It does. It does. You're not going to change somebody's mind 
the, the, the fact of the matter is you shouldn't be trying to change their mind. Honestly, is what it is. You should you should yeah. be having yeah. the conversation and just learning, learning, not not with the intent of I'm trying to change you, you know. Yeah. And that's what it is. Yeah. Um, you, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, TikTok because I think it's cool what you're doing on there, and, and kind of that is what kind of made me want to ask you about any advice you had because you're sharing your story. You know, people can, um, uh, uh, you know, follow along. I would ask you to plug your TikTok, but you have way more views on your TikTok than we're going to have on this. So <laughs> plug my podcast on your TikTok. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, no, but it's awesome because um, they're like these little, uh, I don't know, like sort of a motivational type of thing. Like you're sharing your story, uh, which is fascinating, but also – you know, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not on TikTok really. I'm on Instagram, and you reshare a lot of it on Instagram. That's where I get my, my stuff from. Um, but I always enjoy watching them. Uh, you know, I always learn something new about you. And you know, it, did it all start from just whenever you? That's the idea just popped in your head whenever you got the divorce, or is that something that was planned already that you wanted to start doing? Was having these little micro, uh, yeah. kind of. Yeah. Kind of confessional, motivational sessions. I, I didn't plan it, um, but I think I've learned along the way that there is an audience for it, um, and they mean a lot to me. Like, I think I've developed a fan base um, of people who have also been through really difficult things and who have had to make hard decisions. And... I have found for myself that it's really amazing to hear someone speak to you from a place that you know <laughs> and like encourage you and say things that like you thought no one else understood. Um, and so as I've gone, uh, you know, I think it's been like four months now since I blew up, but the, the comments and the DMs that I would get, I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea that other people with, you know, brain trauma um, and having to make these decisions like with caregiving and their kids and like, so it's been, it's been pretty awesome to get to know those folks and uh, kind of turn the music thing around. I feel like so many musicians these days, it's very like them focused. I'm like, here's this art that I made about myself. I've had fun doing it. Hope you like it. Um, they seem happy, you know, or whatever, and <clears throat> that's that's okay. But I think that people need more than that these days, and um, they're looking for community. They're looking for um, something that adds more meaning to their life, and they want music that speaks to them on a different level. Um, and it can't just be the music; they want all of you. <laughs> so, like total um, access. I. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I withhold some things, you know, some things are sure. just for me and my family, <laughs> but like, uh, I think I realized along the way that th those are the people I'm on TikTok for. Those are the people that I'm making music for. So you'll hear in my videos, um, a lot of times you'll hear me say the word you more than the word I, that's something that my manager called me out for. He's like, if you say I more times in a video than you say you, then that's a little problem. Um, like, and sometimes that's okay, but if I'm really on TikTok for them and to, like, encourage them and give them music that, like, makes their day easier and stuff, uh, I've got to, I've got, that's where the focus has to be. Like, I've got to make that. That's happen. interesting. Yeah, it, it makes sense. It's such a little thing, but it's easy to overlook that without somebody kind of like, you know, hey, you know present it to them and make it about them little things like that make a big difference i think yeah so have you have you had a lot of uh kind of um advice with making these types of videos or have you just kind of figured it out along the way is there somebody that that you, know, you mentioned your manager kind of had that that little tidbit for you is, is there a lot of that yeah. the kind of things you hadn't thought of or um oh yeah i'm like I said, I love working with people who just know more than I do. And so I hired a manager for me last year to just help me. Because <laughs> I was like, I really want to do music. I 
don't know what I'm doing. It's like hard for learning it and stuff. What's the music business all about these days, guys? And they're like, it's TikTok. And honestly, like when I made that first viral video, I wasn't thinking about all that, but they've definitely helped me just think about my presentation and like, who are you really doing this for? Who are you making music for? Here are concrete things you can do when you film, um, when you're writing out like what you want to say uh, that are going to make you just more interesting and more meaningful for people. So I do have these guys who coach me in that area. That's interesting. I'm so, I'm so intimidated by TikTok. Like I just. <laughs> me too. I was terrified. I've only been on it since like November. You have, you have <laughs> like a quarter of a million followers or something, and like millions of likes and I was looking at it earlier today, and I'm like, man, like I just, I, I'd seen it before, and I knew how 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 big you were on there, and I, like that's insane, like it's just crazy how the, the following. It's yeah, it's really cool crazy. though. Yeah. Is there a lot of uh, people that have discovered your music through those um through those videos? I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, it's okay. It's it's not. I'm trying to figure out right now, like, do I want. To it to be more about the music? Do I want to integrate that more? Do I want to keep doing these like daily encouragement videos or whatever? Um, yeah, I, I think yeah. it can be both. Like, I haven't had tons of uh, like a huge increase in listeners um, since go, uh, becoming popular on TikTok. Uh, and I just, I don't know. I, I think that now that I know what my audience is, I think that that will come because now I know who I'm writing for more specifically. Um, and so I can actually create music that they're going to want to hear because it's yeah. huge for them. Um, so I expect that that will take off more. That's like interesting. It's like you have these two fan bases based on two things that you're doing, right? Like you've got your fan, your yeah. fan base for your music, yeah. your fan base for your, uh, your, you know, your motivational, confessional, whatever you want to call them. But it's very interesting um, insights in your life and these videos. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that it makes sense that they've, they've got to overlap, um, you know, at least a little bit. And that would only increase because especially since some of your music, do you, do you still find inspiration, uh, from in your music, from some of these experiences, do you still write about that as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause once, um, you know, I I'm divorced now and it feels like starting life all over again in some ways uh i haven't dated in seven years <laughs> you know it's just and so much has changed since then and so i i know that there are other people out there i'm not that unique like chances are as a songwriter if you're experiencing something struggling with something wondering about something maybe not unique to you and other people can uh relate and grab onto it if if you present it yeah. in the right way um, yeah, I plan to probably be writing more for those. Yeah, I mean, it definitely, it's right there, right? And I think this, you know, I'm, I'm no uh, TikTok coach. Like I said, I don't know anything about it really. But, I mean, it makes sense to kind of pepper in some of the music stuff, right? Because, like, it's, I, they would benefit them, right? You know, so it's a, it's a win-win. Oh, yeah. It's like they're written about situations they know. Very yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. Like, they know so much about you know, this, and it's just, they have a whole new meaning to them. The music and the words and the, the lyrics would have a whole new meaning, I think, for them, since they know, they, they feel like they know you already. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to, I wanted to, to ask you about the, uh, the New York Post article. Um, yeah, sure. That was, it was like two or three months, it was over the summer, right? It was this summer. They yeah. reached out to you. Um, my understanding is it was under the guise of we want to talk to you because this could help other people type of thing. And did they manipulate the story? Of course they did. Uh, the, the headline is awful. Um, and, you know, it seems like they intentionally tried to paint you in a negative light. Uh, it was for clickbait, I guess. What was that experience like? Yeah. Um, sort of your reaction to uh, you know, them initially reaching out versus the finished product of all that? 
Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a very open book. I've, I've gotten smarter. Now I, I get a lot of requests from reporters, and um, I, I don't take 99% of them. I say no. <laughs> Except but, for like, sound out with Jesse yeah. Hubbard, we get we get Kim on the show. Thank you. Well, I just, <laughs> this guy though, I'm gonna. Um, <laughs> they um, yeah, they reached out. I'm I'm open book. I'm like, oh sure, of course, I'll talk to you. And just kind of told them things that I've told other people. And yeah, then this terrible article comes out um, where they omitted so many things. You know, things that I had said hoping to like encourage people in similar situations and um of course I, I think their story did really well and then um I think like four other tabloids kind of copied the story so you know multiple things and like just had all of this hate mail coming at me well the headline was something the headline was like my husband had an aneurysm and I divorced him or something awful like that and you know and I was like come on yeah like okay there was of life in between that and we both agreed on the divorce but no. right. <laughs> it's fine <laughs> it's fine um yeah but people just believe everything that they read there they're like oh yeah that's exactly what happened and so i was just getting like slammed on a daily basis from people thinking that they knew all about our situation and it was hard i got really depressed and didn't want to be on social media i wouldn't go on tiktok for like days um and what eventually pulled me out of it and got me back to work was like I can't let people with these dumb comments like keep me away from the people who are actually wanting and needing to connect with me and others like them, you know. So yeah, I it's still hard. <laughs> I'm still like trying to keep my true audience like uh, right in front of me. <laughs> um, trying to focus on them and just like push the garbage. Right out of the way you know um just create for them people are going to talk they're always going to talk so what were the comments were they were people reaching out to you on social media or or, or was it more of um you know like commenting on the posts from uh from the post no they i guess they were just curious after reading the article and so they found me on tiktok and instagram and facebook and they would just leave hateful comments like on my videos um, when i would post things uh, or just like DM me directly. Um, my favorite one, which I think my drummer is making into a T-shirt, actually. I just love it. I just love my band. But it was like, of course you're from Ohio. You Ursula looking bitch. <laughs> and so I'm like, I mean, this was like my Jeez. everyday Jesse. <clears throat> so I mean, people are so harsh, and they say things about your kids, and it's just tough. And that's what yeah. sucks about it because. Th- this uh, this article was meant to bring those people out of the woodwork, you know. Yeah, whatever. So, yeah. Um. So yeah, I I I don't usually like block people. I will delete things if they're just absolutely hateful. I I'm trying to create conversation, and I don't care if someone comes in with a viewpoint that's like different from mine. That's valid. And I like seeing people interact with each other in the comment section. But if all you're doing is like coming here to like give your opinion that I'm going to hell, that's not really yeah. fruitful. It's like for cool. Anyone. Thanks so, for joining the conversation. Yeah. It was quite a contribution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's got to be hard uh, to you know to kind of push the garbage aside. But you know it's awesome that you're doing that and. There, there's such an audience for what you're doing, both musically, both sharing your experiences, and they are connected. And so, you know, kudos to you for doing that. It's tough, but anybody that I've ever seen that's successful, and they have to deal with that. And there's going to be haters, you know. And yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if anybody truly ever gets used to it, but you know, keep on doing what you're doing, without a doubt. Um, it's important. It is important. It's very, very important. All of it. Um, I'm going to let you go here in a minute, uh, but I wanted to talk about Thunderstruck. Yeah, so was that a, was seems to me like a result from kind of the, the situation with um, uh, the Post article and all that. So uh, tell everybody about Thunderstruck and what exactly that is. Sure. Thunderstruck is a free online community that I created 
for people who have um, just been through kind of devastating things and need to connect with others who know what they're talking about and what they're dealing with. Because um, what I found was, you know, all these people were commenting and sending me messages. I don't know everything. I can talk to like a certain number of people a day, but um, why should the other people just like be limited to my knowledge or my time, you know? So <clears throat> I, um, you can only say so much in TikTok comments anyway. So like I made this website, I think it's like 150 members at this point. Anybody can sign up. Um, and it, there's just like a chat and all these different sections. People can tell their stories and other people can like encourage them or some people will come on with really specific questions like, hey, I have lost my entire friend group. Like no one understands. How did you guys find me after this crisis hit you? And then people will like just chime in, you know? So it's a really cool thing. Um, it's thunderstruck.mn.co. Thunderstruck.mn.co. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was looking into that a little bit, and I had seen it when you initially posted it, and I was kind of revisiting that. It just seems like such an important uh, tool to have for people going through similar things. Uh, I think that's awesome. Do you think, yeah, is I that think going to continue to grow? Do you think that's, that's a goal of yours, to continue that on? Yeah, I would love to, man, I would love to do so many things, and um you know, I'd love to have like actual doctors and counselors get involved with that group of people. And um, it's, I'm just in like the very early stages of it, but it's definitely becoming. Yeah, I mean, only a couple months old, really, right? Yeah, so I mean, that's that's incredible, yeah, though. Pretty um, cool. What's next? What's next for you? What's, what's what? What do you want to do next? <laughs> um, I would like to try to bridge the gap a bit between. Um, the music audience and the TikTok audience. I think uh, I just want us all to be one big happy family. So I'll be I'll be working on that. I kind of, we kind of just finished a whole slew of summer shows, so probably not much live performance. Um, but I I have been writing a lot. Um, you know, with this new um, audience in mind, uh, just some songs that like maybe give voice to the really difficult things to say, not just about trauma, but also about church. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm hoping that I'll be able to get into the studio um, in the next six months or so and get those written. That's, no, that's awesome. <laughs> um, do me a favor when you do that. I know it's hard. I know it's a pain in the ass, but put out a vinyl. I, I, want, I, want, I want one for my collection. <laughs> so it's, I can't show this to my bandmates. So we're telling you. I know you. it's it's a pain in the ass and it's super expensive and it, it's all of the problems. But I would like one. That's all I'm saying. Okay. All right. I'll keep in mind, Jesse. Um, Kim, thank you so much for uh, for doing this. We've been trying to uh, lock this down for a while, and it's uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I'm a huge fan of your music, but I think more importantly, I'm a huge fan of you as a person, and so um, and all the things that you're doing. Thanks so much for having me on. It's always great to talk with you. I always, like, I'm so excited when I see you guys come to the door at shows. And, like, I'm, I'm glad that you're that you're back at this. Uh, you're, you're doing Oh, thank amazing you. I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate you so much. You're one of the good ones, that's for sure. Um, Kim Beyer, uh, thank you again. Everybody, thank you for joining the show. This is Sound Out. Till next time, friends. <laughs>